KGRA Digital Broadcasting and Pop Culture Minefield presents Dangerous Military Nerds. Dangerous Military Nerds. They're just like regular nerds, only dangerous. And now, your hosts, Don Ecker and Gary Cassell. All Where's right. Don Ecker. Don Ecker. Ecker. Hey, we'll have a little bit more of him here. I'll do the PG version for Rod Lurie. <laughs> Warning. The following program involves discussions between military veterans. Enjoy. <laughs> That's the clean version. <laughs> uh, it is uh, another uh, hump day and uh, another episode of Dangerous Military Nerds hey, with Don I... Anchor and me. And Oh, and you've Gary. got your fuel up outstanding. Outstanding. Oh, I mean uh, it. Man, that stuff's, oh, it's a miracle. Uh, but we have a very special guest here. But before we get to our guest, we're going to get our good friend, uh, panelist, regular panelist, Mad Mardigan, also known as Mad Chismo. And Mad will be joining us with talking to Rod today because, uh, like myself, he's a big fan of Rod. Now, you know I'm a history buff, right? Oh, you know, I, oh, college sorry, was my, uh, was, my major was history. And uh, I'm I'm nuts about history. You know that, right, Gary? You know that. I, I heard something about it. Well, I, I, I want to let I want to let Mad. I want to give Mad a little <laughs> oh my God, military history. Okay, a little history. I apologize, but, Rod. Um, I Mad for this. World War II began <laughs> actually in Europe in 1939. Now the oh, Americans became involved in December of 1941 oh when Japan treacherously attacked our naval fleet at Pearl Harbor. Okay. So from 41 to 45, this, man. we yeah, whipped their ass. Okay. We really did. We sunk every Japanese boat on the freaking surface. I saw now, Michael Bay's Pearl Harbor. I know these things. I'm not <laughs> even going to discuss what we did to Germany. But then for five years, we had pretty much God. peace, although things were heating up with the Russians. Now, in June of 1950, okay, June 25th, actually the 25th of June is my wife's birthday, North Korea assaulted South Korea. Now, do you know when my birthday was, Matt? 18 years prior? No, it was a month and one day later. <laughs> okay, July that's pretty close, 26, though. So close. Okay, July 26, 19 fucking 50. All right. Now, my dad was a World War II vet. Oh, it looks like Rod's ready to come on. They retreaded <laughs> his ass. They retreaded his ass for Korea, which really upset my mom. But no, I, I was way too young to serve there. So I just, yeah. I wanted to get all that straight. Okay, <laughs> right. Mary, we're good. You and made me watch Alien Outpost. All right, we're even. Uh, we're even. <laughs> 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 all right, I got to explain that to Rod when he comes on. Ladies and gentlemen, our guest of the day, a fellow dangerous nerd, is none other than Rod Lurie. Um, we're going to move him up here. Here, I'll move here. And there we go. We got the perfect sandwich, <laughs> and uh, it's an honor to have you back. This is your third time on our channel. I'm so glad you're here. Yeah, three times. Yes, this will be the third time today. Oh fuck, man! <laughs> I start charging with the third time. <laughs> that was the third time. Okay. <laughs> you guys. I understand, you. Rod. You're you're a West Point grad. I know that's not good. No, no, you, my, my okay. stepson is a is a West Point grad. Oh, okay, great. How old, uh, is, how old, how old is your stepson? 50. 50, okay, so I wouldn't know. I'm a little older. All right. Yeah. Th that surprised 50. the hell out of me. I was like 20, 22, maybe, not 50. <laughs> yeah, 30. Hey, I was born in 50, kid. That <laughs> means that I'm 70, well, yeah, 72 now. 
Yeah, I know math sucks when you get that that age. Yeah. <laughs> um, look, we have a lot of fun on this show, Rod, and I've been wanting to get you on for a while. And Keith and I keep talking, and he's supposed to be here, by the way. Keith has been like, um, I, I said, at least have one friendly face for Rod to look at, and he's late. <laughs> Wait, you guys are not friendly faces? Oh, you know I am. I love you, man. Oh. I'm a. I am such a big fan of your work. I really am. I remember I surprised you the first time I, because I, I, I started talking about your your first major film, and I like threw out some stuff about it because I I own a copy of it, and it's like I'll throw it in every once in a while, watch it because you're you're what I refer to as an actor's director, mm -hmm. and uh, and I like that you know because some directors, great directors as they are, aren't very good with actors, but I can tell you are. Because you get the actors to do exactly what you want them to do. And well, I actually, I, I get them to do exactly what they want to do. And that, oh. and that, and that to But then honest, you trick them into thinking that it's what they want to do, but it's actually you. Well, uh, look, it's, in, in my opinion, one of the great virtues of a good director is to understand what are the specific strengths of the actors with whom he or she is working and to exploit those strengths as much as possible. And if you get a really great actor, I've worked with some of the greatest actors in the history of the screen. Jeff Bridges, um, Gary Oldman, Robert Redford, Joan Allen, and um, among Gina Davis, among many. And, you know, you know, they come with their own ideas about how a role should be performed. And if you don't exploit those ideas, you know, you're kind of a moron because you're working with some of, you know, the greatest minds in the history right. of the medium. I got a question, and yes. this is something that I've been thinking about since I saw your film. Okay. okay. When you were putting all this together. Now, I, I know. You're talking about the outpost right the now? Out, I'm sorry. Yes, the okay. outpost. Uh, and you even had guys that had been there during the mm -hmm. actual fight. Mm -hmm. Right. Exactly. Okay. Did you wonder because i did okay as a as a combat vet and mm -hmm. uh as a movie going a uh, goer mm -hmm. i i mean i movies have been a huge part of my life who mm -hmm. in the hell put that freaking outpost in a valley did none of them ever hear of dnbn foo for christ's sake well dnbn foo was um part of the, the French v, v, French Vietnamese War. And of course, it was probably one, the greatest, one of the greatest disasters since the Napoleonic era for, for the French. So, the, okay, the answer to your question is actually kind of funny. Uh, there, there definitely was a decision to uh, put this outpost in uh, the bottom of a valley, at the bottom of, uh, in the bottom of these mountains, and they were complete, uh, to use a cliche, sitting, sitting ducks as a result. There was a logic to it. Uh, one was that they wanted to get them close to villages so that they could have, uh, you know, the, what they call the, the counter-terrorism. And, uh, and, and also it was to help block the supply lines from, from Pakistan. Still, probably, and, and that was determined by the Army to be really ill-fated. When I was a cadet at West Point, <clears throat> there was um, an older cadet who was in charge of me. His name was uh, Mick Nicholson. And he was probably one of the greatest cadets that ever walked the plains at West Point. He, uh, he, he actually came back to West Point after getting a full-on degree from Georgetown. And then he had to go and complete another bachelor's degree at West Point. But he was, so he was a brilliant guy, strack as hell, uh, just fantastic. I was a terrible cadet, and he <laughs> tried to run me the fuck out of there. <laughs> Did everything he could, I, I, I would say. He, he was tough as fucking nails. And um, anyway, I managed to survive. Mick eventually became a four-star general. I think he is a four-star general. But he was also a colonel. And he is the guy who set up the outpost. Literally, oh, wow. he is the guy. Oh shit! Yeah. So, you know, I tried. Yeah. To Somebody to should have fried school. his ass. Nah, you know it, what? No, it, no, come on. I, I tried. I tried reaching out to him. He was. A, he's a great soldier and a great gentleman. This was. Uh, this was definitely. Um, well, they did an investigation too, didn't they? 
There was a full on investigation. Yeah. So they, and then they dismantled all of these um, at risk outposts as a result. The Marines damn near did that in Vietnam, okay, in 68, I, right before that. I mean, they, they were undergoing the same business. Well, there, there certainly is a history in the military of several times where there are maybe well intentioned, but ultimately foolish decisions to put outposts and to put our, our units in you know, in, in, into into positions where they are simply become prey. It's a, but, you know, and, and we discussed that at the end of the movie. There's yeah. a timeline to explain how yeah. the investigation. And, but, you know, it, it's, it's, it's interesting. Oh. The Outpost is not a, a, remotely a political film. You know. To, no, it's to a very me, straightforward pro-soldier film. I, I'm really glad that you said that because that's what I am. I'm pro-soldier. Yeah. And I don't want to say I'm anti-military or pro-military. I, I think that the military, our military, we all have our beefs and loves. We make great, we make great decisions. We make terrible decisions. How we handled, you could argue the opposite, I suppose. But the 1992 invasion of um, uh, the, the of Iraq uh, after liberating them from Kuwait, or I, we, we didn't invade liberating Kuwait. Yeah, I, you know, we liberated Kuwait. We didn't invade Iraq and. Some people were saying that, that that we should have, but that was like a very successful military action. Now we had a few military successes in the in the twenty years war, almost twenty years war, that um, uh, that we were just involved with. But there were lot, lots and lots of mistakes made, and the outpost was definitely one of them. Well, I mean, and it wasn't just Afghanistan. I I, I was in Iraq, a Fourth ID as well, but I mm -hmm. but I was in uh, West Rashid Baghdad, and to me what it what it felt like was you had officers that came up like okay we need this done and it's the craziest shit you've ever seen and you have ncos like oh, all right we're gonna try to make this work mm -hmm. there was another unit that was being hit a lot by ieds in this one area and so what they had us do everyone in the everyone in this in, in this area you would do five hours where you would where you would drive your vehicles in a circle it was a square because of the roads mm -hmm. for five hours make sure nobody puts any ieds there five hours we call it the baghdad 500 in the middle of this we're driving we're, we're doing this and they forgot to put because you know pm goes to am they forgot to fill that slot so we had to do another five hours <laughs> just driving in a circle in the middle of baghdad <laughs> it, and it was always something like that you know and it's it, they're very reactionary i think mm -hmm. um i i'm shocked that after what happened you know uh at that outpost they didn't start you know, having a mandate that they all have to be on top of mountains because when I got injured in Iraq, uh, we were all burnt in our vehicle. We were uh, hit the fuel cell and all that. Mm -hmm. And I had been begging to wear the Nomex w when we, you know, took out the Bradley. And w after we got hit, they're like, everyone's wearing a Nomex. Don't care if you're in a Humvee, Bradley, whatever. Everyone's you, in you Nomex. explain to the folks who may not know what that is, what you're talking what, about? What, Nomex? Nomex yeah. is fire resistant uh, suit is zipped up. I didn't wear it because I was like, because I was scared of fire. I, I wanted to, I'm in a Bradley and it's, it's uh, Iraq. It's really hot. So I wanted to be able to unzip it and pull it down by my ankles. That's why I wanted to wear it, but it, it would have helped with the fire as well. Got it. And he uh, did get burned. He has a, uh, yeah. his disability is based on his uh, injuries. And, uh, Sorry to hear that, Matt. Oh, that's rough as fuck. Man. I mean, this is, 2006. He manages right still to be a very funny guy. I like hanging out. Uh -huh. <laughs> and handsome. Oh, thank you. Well, well, like the face. Look, look I like. Face. I like oh, to fuck with man. Listen, I like to fuck with. Him. <laughs> yeah, no, the face came out. Man. Yeah, you're face came out good. Um, you're as good looking as Scotty in Orlando Bloom. Oh, or, oh, hey, oh, let me. Can shit. I ask you something about about? There was it was um right before the Brits, the ID. Mm -hmm. Oh, where uh, uh, yeah, Scott. Oh, he's, the one he's shot. Yeah, he, well, not that, not the oneer, but when he's explaining what he would do if he was going to attack. Right, yeah, when he's on top of the mountain, sure. D did he realize how much he was his him dad in that moment when you he's squinting in the I, sun? I, I gotta, okay, so what you're bringing up is something really interesting, and we, it's like sometimes it's really fucking spooky yeah. how much he looks and sounds like his father. And some of the expressions, and even the way that he holds his jaw, sometimes. And there is no milkman involved in this situation. <laughs> yeah. That's oh, good God! Milk. There is one line he delivered. Uh, it's like right when he comes back to the post, and 
I wasn't looking at, at the screen when I was doing, I was doing some artwork and I heard him speak and I turned real quick because I swear to God, it sounded like his dad. Well, I mean, it, it really is. But, and I'll tell you, and, and, and Scotty uh, loves and respects his father and we talk about him all the time. And if he really, if he really wanted to get his way on a, on a set, he said, well, this is the way my dad would have drew it. <laughs> you know, and, you know, and of course, his dad has directed some of the greatest films of, of all time. And in fact, I would say that if, if I had to build a Mount Rushmore to the film industry, um, he certainly would be a candidate. Clint Eastwood would to be up there. But I but but from an acting style point of view, I'm more reminded of Paul Newman working with Scott than I am of uh, that. I mean, it's distracting because he does look and sound so much like him. But the Paul Newman is my favorite actor of all time, and uh, and I, I think Scott is going to have a massive critical um, uh, life ahead of him. He's a he's a very very smart and he's extremely talented and one of the uh, my favorite actors that I've ever worked with. Um, tire, an absolute tireless worker. And you were on the other side, <clears throat> Milo during, Gibson. Oh, I'm sorry. Go ahead. Yeah, during uh, the time following World War II, uh, a lot of actors, a lot, mm -hmm. were veterans. Veterans. Okay. Right. And, and directors, too. Mm -hmm. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. And uh, then we get up through Korea up to Vietnam, and uh, it dropped off dramatically, mm -hmm. the number of people. What well, about today? Right. I mean, you know, once a draft went away, then it drops off almost yeah. completely. There, there are a couple of, um, you know, Adam Driver is mm -hmm. better, but I don't. Right. He, but he never served in combat, as far as I know. No, no he he no, got a medical was discharge. A, yeah. Yeah. So I, you know, there there aren't many people who were veterans that uh, that became that became actors, and certainly not successful ones. Um, <clears throat> you know, Jack Kessie. Um, in our movie, he um, he's a veteran, and uh, Kwame Patterson, who played the the African American commander at the end of the, the movie, he's uh, he's also a veteran, and so we had a number of actors who had served. Um, um, Hank Hank Hughes, um, who's in the film and was my principal advisor and actually helped write some of the screenplay. He you know he's he's a veteran. Daniel Rodriguez plays himself in the movie. Yeah, which is an unbelievable story, right? You're playing yourself in a movie, and he had to stage for us the death of his best friend, who died right in front of him. Yeah. And that's one thing that uh, I think we talked about because Mad joined me on Monday. Because on Monday I do a show called Military Money, where we talk about a military TV series worthy of note or classic films. And of course, we did The Outpost on Monday, mm. and that you know his doing that scene. Uh, how did that impact him doing that? Well, you know, so he, he's a, this dude, he's a, to call him an overachiever is an understatement. He promised Thompson, uh, his buddy who died, um, that he was going to play big league college football, maybe in the NFL. And Danny is like 140, 150 pounds, you know, <laughs> so strong as hell. An unbelievable condition, and and he kept his word to Thompson, and he went and played at Clemson, and then got as far as um, being in the preseason on kickoff returns for the Seattle Seahawks, wow. and you know, <laughs> um, I wanted him in the movie, and he was sort of, and I'm going to answer your question in a second. He was hemming and hawing, and not, and his team, his team, so to speak, the managers and the agents, they don't know whether or not to allow him to come, and so he wasn't going to do the movie. And and after speaking to him, I knew what an overachieving uh, son of a gun this guy is, and I knew how much he wanted to do this, and I knew how much how important it was to get accurate. So what I did is I found some Bulgarian guy named a little chubby. And I told him, this is who's gonna, this, I said, this is who's going to play you. Oh. <laughs> and he calls you to get some advice. And Rodriguez writes to me and he says, I'm coming. <laughs> you know, you know? And so, yeah, it's dirty. That's good. Yeah, so, so, then, so then Rodriguez shows up and he's unfucking believably helpful. 
with everything because he was there. He was there talking to me about um, what to do uh, in terms of production design and behavior of the soldiers. And, and then it came to this very emotional thing, which is we asked him if he would replicate this for us and show us exactly what happened. And that was very profound because he helped us. He was unbelievably professional, didn't miss a beat, acted it out for us several times. We got a perfect, and then he went off on his own, and I think maybe he had a breakdown. I I don't – man, that's amazing. I don't think – because when, when I got hit, my, I mean, absolute best friend uh, died. He died – a couple of weeks after we got hit from the injuries, but I have no problem telling the story. I have no problem talking about it. I, I think it's very helpful to do so, but to try and reenact everything that happened is just, I don't, it doesn't you, compute for me. You're falling into Audie Murphy territory here. Yeah. yeah that, as but, well, no, Audie played himself in that movie. Yeah, Audie, Audie right. played himself, but, but, I, but I will tell you that it was, I almost did the Audie Murphy movie. I will tell you that, you know, he's one of the greatest, probably the most decorated soldier of all time. He, he is, yeah. But, you know, I'm still a little, a little bit embellished in the movies. And um, <laughs> it, a little bit of movie magic in there. And um, But Danny just told it fucking straight. And he did some things. He, he did, Danny did, Danny, like everyone else, did some things that they looked back on retrospectively, and which maybe they hadn't or... I, I don't know, um, but he put everything in, and he wanted to do everything. That's that's amazing. That's fantastic, and uh, you know, the, the, from every veteran out there, thank you for doing that, Rod. Well, can I real quick? I know Gary wants to move on, but you were well, talking I, about. I wanted to ask one question about Milo, but you go ahead. Well, because uh, you're you're talking about how how uh, helpful he was with how it looks and how the the soldiers interact with each other mm -hmm. and i've noticed the only two things that i've seen that really kind of nail what it is modern day uh generation kill that was on hbo and they had the some of the same guys but what um what when i first watched it it took me three hours to get through your movie because i kept stopping and to explain to my girlfriend how amazing it is to see so many spit bottles and i really had <laughs> to explain right. <laughs> why that's such a big deal but i mean it it, it feels so authentic and lived in from Thank you. i mean look we we not only had the real guys there but uh um we had this dude named uh, jericho denman and uh, ray mendoza they were these um they, they are vets who are also our military experts. And yeah. uh, I don't know if you haven't had those guys in your show, you absolutely should. Um, Give me the contact info. I will contact them. I'd love I mean, to they were, those guys. They, they, were, they were stunningly, um, stunningly helpful. And <laughs> they were, we, you know, we did a lot of uh, wonders, as I think one of you referred to it as, and that's what it is. Yeah, the wonder with the yeah. scene at the bridge. I'm not cutting away. It means I'm going to shoot. I can even call it the N word, and he'd be okay with that. <laughs> what? Well, that's, that's about where the it starts. He's quoting your movie, right? Oh, <laughs> I no. Oh, I thought you were doing a character. It's like, yeah. Well, okay, oh, by the way, Keith anyway, is here. Anyway, anyway, anyway um, hello. They are. Uh, you know, we're doing these wonders, and you have to get those exactly right, right? So they they go for a long time. And I've got explosions, and I've got stuntmen, and I've got actors, and I got a camera guy that's got to be exactly in yeah. the right place. And so one thing goes wrong, you got to start all over again, right? So we did this one take of the most complicated scene, and I think it was um, the one in which um, um, Mace is being brought back on a stretcher back to, right. back to the infirmary, and. It's a difficult thing to shoot. It ended up fantastic, but it is difficult. And we finally, uh, we're like on the third take. And the actors are brilliant. Caleb Landry Jones is just like fucking on fire. Henry Hughes is on fire. They're exhausted. They're carrying, they, they, you know, they carried Mace, uh, the, the actor, several times. And the explosion is going off perfectly. Everything's going off well. And, 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 and eventually they get into the aid station and they collapse and they have to do the whole scene there as well. That also has to be perfect. And we nailed it. We got it, man. We finally fucking 
got it. And everybody's hugging. And Ty Carter, the Medal of Honor recipient who was on the set, was hugging us also. It was emotional. We got it so right. And everybody's high-fiving. And I got to tell you, it's a big moment when you nail a one. Yeah. And then Jericho walks in. And he goes, no, 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 no. I said, what do you mean, no, 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 no. He goes, no, no. We, we. I said, look great to me. It looks great to Ty. It looks great to everybody else. He goes, there are these two fucking, you know, soldiers in the background who didn't hold their weapons correctly. <laughs> <laughs> okay. And I said, Jericho, give me a break. And he says, okay, you know what? If you want every veteran in America to laugh at your movie, fine. And he walked away. And I looked at him. Let's do it again. <laughs> you know? You know, Hurt Locker could have used those guys because. Yeah, yeah I don't even want to go into Hurt Locker. Yeah, I, I, I owe um, so much to the military experts on this film because although I am indeed a veteran, I have not was not in the Army for a very long time. I am not a combat veteran. Not, not one bullet ever went past my head, ever. I was never in danger. So... Although um, I served, combat arms, all that stuff, I didn't know this, and I really needed the help of these military experts, and they gave it to me. I tell and you I, that it's, I know because I work for Dale Dye. You know who he is, and uh, wow, he's my he's Dale, boss. Was Dale was he, one of my movies. Yeah, Dale is my boss, and uh, I work for both Warriors Incorporated and Warrior Publishing. And uh, the one thing I've always been happy and pr proudest thing I think I can say is he, of all the work I've done for him for the past 15 years, he's only corrected me twice. Okay. And no. I just, I just lucky at, at figuring things out how they're supposed well, to. Well, I mean, I, I, I think it, it uh, not to tell you how to do your job. That yes. One of these things you should tell people who Dale Dye is, was he is an incredible important fixture. Well, they refer to him as Hollywood's drill sergeant. He's the guy behind Saving Private Ryan, uh, Band of Brothers, the Pacific, and the forthcoming third series in that Masters. World War II. Yeah, Tom Hanks and him. And I also worked with Tom Hanks on the film that's still not been shot yet, No Better Place to Die, based on the book. Uh, wow. It's the in-country battle during D-Day, uh, where they had to take these tanks out on a bridge. And it was just a bloody battle. Well, and, and well, well, Dale will probably be involved in that as well. But Dale also did um, his main claim to fame, not main, his first claim to fame was uh, Platoon. Damn right. He wrote the book, too. And, you know, and the, the realism that he brings is it's pretty extreme. And he um, I did a boxing film with him and he I used his voice as the voice of a uh, of a sports of a sports announcer. And he uh, has a distinct voice, man. He, does. he gifted me um, a West Point robe from like the 1940s. Oh, really, really great for you. He's a, he's a lovely man. All he ever sends me is comic books. <laughs> okay. <laughs> well, good ones. Though. They're classic World War II comics, but he'll find one and he'll send it to me. I love that. He's a total fucking legend. Yes, he is. <laughs> and I've tell people there are only three people on this planet. That when they said my name or, or spoke to me, it caused my ass to clench. One was my XO in the army. Uh, the other one was my, and, and please don't make a joke about this, my priest. He's also my godfather. And then Dale Dye. Dale Dye says my name, everything's fine. But the minute he says son, I know that he's got a problem. With something oh my God. I did. All right. And my, just yeah. everything in me clenches. I'm like, oh, what did I do? <laughs> but uh, there you go. I got to tell you, we got a, a, a super chat here from Christian Delorme. Uh, his son is in the Canadian military, mm -hmm. um, and he sent us a Canadian $5. As a military dad, shout out to all you boys and Keith. Barry White bequeathed his voice to you. I'm talking to you, Keith. And wow. what great show, everyone. And then I have another message, and I'll give you a thank you video in a second. Scribe Light writes, Mr. Lurie, Thank you for, for Deterrence, which I've talked to you about this film. Yeah. I love that film. It's one of my favorite comfort movies, as odd as that might sound. Yeah. So when people say that, that's not good. <laughs> no, <laughs> it's not supposed to make you feel comfortable. Well, it's, like, it's like I, it's like I want to prepare great meals and somebody says, hey, thank you for the comfort food. 
Yeah, I think I, 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 I described like thank you, thank you very much. Deterrence was my uh, was my very first film. It's a one set movie, and um, you know it's very very fun um, part of my my past. And uh, I made it for eight hundred thousand dollars with Kevin Pollock and Timothy Hutton, Shirley Ralph. So thank you. It's a great film, man. You know I've talked about it. I I have a copy on me all the time. Uh, actually, I think I have all but one of your films. I do not have a copy of Killing Reagan. Well, Killing Reagan is um, Killing Reagan is a really I think it's a really good film. I did for National Geographic. You know, it's it's uh, I'll tell you, it's interesting that that's a movie about the assassination attempt by John Hinckley mm -hmm. on, on, Ron, on Ronald Reagan, and Tim Matheson is just so fucking good as as Reagan. It's like uh, nailed it. Also, uh, I can't remember the actress's name that plays Nancy Reagan. And God, Cynthia, she was Cynthia Nixon. Cynthia oh. Nixon. Yeah, and and um, anyway, it's a um, it, it's a really good film, and and I, I, you know, we were getting to the nomination phases of the Emmy Awards and the Critics' Choice Awards. And and then um, Bill O'Reilly got caught in that horrible sex horrible scandal thing. Thing, rape thing. And it was like, <laughs> none of us want to, you know, it's like we all had a disconnect. And it, everybody just goes, hide. <laughs> yeah, it was really, it was really unfortunate because, you know, he's, you know, he's not a good man. I mean, what he did was, was awful. And I and I wrote to him. But I love his books, though. Well, the thing is that you know, you, you know, I have to get rid of all the books. I just can't be associated with that dude. And and I wrote to him and I said, look, I'm I'm starting to get contacted by some people in the press asking me, you know, about you a little bit. And I'm going to tell them, to put it bluntly, what a disappointment he is. And he wrote me back and saying, I you know, I shouldn't jump to conclusions and all that. But you know, yeah, I'm pretty comfortable being. <laughs> This well, look, yeah. I, I got to point out something because somebody asked me, actually, multiple people asked me to ask you and bring this up because I've never brought this up the last few times we had you on, that you referred to Danny DeVito as a um, testicle oh, with arms and legs. <laughs> that was when I was a film critic and I was a real asshole. <laughs> I've got to <laughs> tell you, man, I bet you he laughed when he read that. Oh, he did not laugh. No, he did not. Oh, no. no, 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 no. I did no. my research. He did not laugh. He did not fucking laugh, and and in fact, uh, let me let me say a couple of things about that. <laughs> okay, uh, about the time that I wanted to become a, a filmmaker, I wrote a screenplay, and I was told that Ray Fiennes was interested in playing the lead, oh. and that was amazing. So, I now have to go to CAA to meet with his agent, and as I'm driving over to CAA, I get a phone call from my partner saying. You can't go into CA. They're gonna have security remove you if you try walking in the doors. Oh shit! I'm like, what the fuck did I do wrong? And he said, Rafe has the same agent as Danny DeVito, Ugh. and you know, and they took great offense that, that 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 you wrote that, and so that really hurt me. And you know, as I was beginning my career, guys, I had I had to pay the piper several times for things that I wrote as a film critic. Look, I was uh, w when I was a film critic. I, there's so many critics, you have to find a way to stand out. So I decided to become, you know, you know, really infamous. And, 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 and much of what I wrote, although always accurate to my opinion, was, you know, sometimes designed to be provocative in a way that everybody would be talking about. Well, just so, to and, defend you, though, for a second, military well, veterans have a tendency of being shoot from the hip kind of people. Yeah, I know, I know, but I, you know, I'm a, I still shouldn't have, you know, it, it was interesting because I spoke to his publicist and the guy said, you know, he's a human being and he's got a wife and he's got kids and he's got friends and he's embarrassed by that. And, you know, yeah. and, and you know, the thing is that I, I took that and credited properly. Um, Pauline Kale, the great film critic said something similar about another actor named Bob Hoskins. And, and so, but you know, yeah, I was, I was, I was a real, there was a real asshole. I mean, there was one time when I was doing my movie called The Contender and Bill Paxton. Uh, An Oscar nominated film, by the way. Yes, thank you, it was. Um, he, uh, I wanted Bill Paxton to be in the film. I wanted him to play the wife or the husband of Joan Allen. And he says, great, meet me at the Peninsula Hotel at 9 a.m. 
So I go to the very expensive Peninsula Hotel, <laughs> and Bill is Bill Paxson is already at the table. And not only that, he's finished his breakfast. Oh no! Yeah, and I say, "Hey, Bill," and he looks at me and he wipes in his napkin, wipes his mouth off, and he says, "I really just wanted you to come and meet me, so I could tell you to fuck off." <laughs> Wow. And, he said, and he explained to me, I wrote a review of his for a movie called The Dark Backward, where I said something like, if you can take away a, writer, an act, a driver's driver's license for bad driving, why can't you take away their sad car? Oh, no. <laughs> oh my oh, God. Geez, no. So anyway, so he was, and then he got up and he left and, and, and I got stuck with a bill. Oh, no. <laughs> okay, anyway, so now now the movie comes out. You said it was Oscar nominated, uh, and and I and I met him at the at a, at a at a party for the Golden Globes when we were nominated, and he was very kind, and you know, and it ended up being no harm, no foul at all. And then we started talking about trying to trying to work together, but I, you know, I, I was, you know, I was an asshole, and um, we were all very influenced by Howard Stern back then, you know, to have that kind of blatant, edgy, yeah, blatant, edgy, edgy honesty and no holds barred, and uh, and so on. And I succeeded in making a name for myself. People wanted to read my screenplays because they wanted to know what this asshole was writing. Yeah. Um, and I regret. I, I do regret. Um, Quite a, I do quite a bit of it. <laughs> but, I'll, I'll be honest; that story makes me uh, really miss Bill Paxton even more. Because that well, he was he he was just wonderful, especially his movies with James Cameron. And you know, it's like I like I adored him in Aliens. Yeah, you know, you know what are we gonna? Uh, Vasquez. Yeah, uh, <laughs> frailty. He was great in True Lies. So he really was good in True Lies too, and frailty the uh, the one that he directed. With Matthew I McConaughey, love that uh, it wasn't Terminator. Amazing, amazing. Yeah, no, he, he was he's a, also he was a commando. Yeah. He's a very, very good dude. And um, anyway, but I had a few. I had a few. Now that's all sort of died away. And, you know. Yeah. But on, on the on the other hand, guys, what I will tell you is that um, when I told an actor how much I loved them, they knew I wasn't bullshit. You know, like. When I told Joan Allen, I thought she's the best actor in the world. She says, I know. I know you know. I know you <laughs> Because you've written that many times or said that many times. I had a radio show, which was just as brutal as my writing, and if not more so. And so, but, but, but when I complimented people, they knew that it was for real, you know? Yeah. Well, there's a sincerity. And once again, I, I still attribute that to just sort of the, the candor and the way that veterans are. You know, after the military, we tend to be just straight shooters and get well, to the point. Well, you know that that's true, but I want—I I just want to go back, and and I cannot reiterate. Just because I saw what these guys went through in the outposts and talking to those veterans and everything they went through, I cannot reiterate to you more how I was never in danger, and that crustiness that you're talking about usually comes from having been in situations where, you know, nothing yes. is, nothing is going to phase you ever again. And, you know, you know, I, I, I wasn't like Matt. I wasn't, you know, I wasn't like Don. I mean, I've, I've not been through it. Yeah. As well, well I you know, I, I, I had a flashback. I had a flashback when I watched the outpost. Mm -hmm. I had been in a, a nine man team stationed up on the demilitarized zone right off the Kaviet river right before the North Vietnamese army invaded, mm -hmm. starting what today is known as the Easter offensive. Mm -hmm. And uh, I was on an M60 machine gun. Our mm -hmm. bunker, we had a lot of TS and C equipment in there. Mm -hmm. And uh, <clears throat> we had to make sure nobody could get to that. And I mean, nobody, including our South Vietnamese allies, mm -hmm. if that's in fact what they were. And uh, when I watched the outpost and I saw them overrunning that base because we mm -hmm. get overrun, Rod. Yeah. We get overrun. 
that uh, that brought back some bad memories. I'm sorry. I mean, you know, it's it's interesting. I'm, I'm I'm sorry that you had that. I'm sorry that you had that experience, sir. And and but but I, what I what I will tell you about the outpost is I think that its biggest virtue was that veterans like Mad could just didn't have to answer questions anymore from their family or their friends and just say, here is what it was. And, and I cannot tell you how emotional it becomes for me and for anybody involved with film when people talk about their new ability to communicate with family members. Uh, you, you absolutely, find yeah. yeah. Oh, for sure. Um, I did have to stop and explain. I And I love this. You you never took a moment to explain things that wouldn't be explained. You you know what I mean? Uh, like uh, yeah. uh, Battle for uh, Los Angeles, the alien movie. They yeah. kept expl- over explaining. That was really oh, annoying. I yeah, agree. Florida Operating Base. They explain all the acronyms and everything. But your but your movie it just it, you it just doesn't. Say it and move on. They, yeah, exactly. It, a, you know what? It's a little bit like uh, um, watching. You're too young for this, Mad. Maybe Don is not and Jerry's not. Just a baby. I guarantee Don's not. There was a, a series called ER. Fuck you, man. Oh, Fuck I, you. I, I am familiar with ER. My mom made me watch it as a kid. I remember ER, well, yes. Then, you know, they're talking all this medical talk. Right. And they just, you know, and, and you understand the story. And you don't need to have everything. Yeah. Have every, you know, like, I don't need to explain what an LRAS is. You know, nope. People will just know it's, you know, it's, it's a thing on a base, you know. And it's... Uh, you know, we, we, you know, we don't need to get into depths of what it is. We don't need to explain what an E4 is or what an E5 mm-hmm. is. You know, you don't, you don't need to explain all this stuff in, in a movie like this when it's simply, when the palpability becomes, um, um, you know, really comes to play, in, especially during the battle. Well, for your movie, I had more positive reactions to what were happening than negative because of how, how, real it was for me just seeing the spit bottles i know it's it uh, won't make sense no, to everybody I, I but that that's a too. really big thing but lone survivor which was a good movie um i can't watch it again because of how visceral and how real they depicted uh gunshot wounds mm. it was too much for me mm. to see you know um, you know i knew his dad Marky Mark? Mad. I, I served the seal that uh oh the seal that was uh that was killed the yeah. oh, uh, when he got killed. Lone survivor, yeah. <clears throat> I was a uh, commander of the military order, the Purple Heart Hollywood chapter out here. And his father was uh was in the Purple Heart with me. And uh uh when that movie came out, I saw it, I'll tell you what, oh my god. I could only ever watch. That's one movie I could only watch once. Yeah, me too. And I like Peter Berg as a director. It's a, it's a, he's a wonderful director. Yeah. It's a very, it's a very, very good film. And it was also heavily, it was heavily supported by the by, um, um, by the military in the sense that they had really good military advisors on that film as well. Yes, I'll tell you how important military advisors are to uh, to movies like this. And, and not only that, you need to have a great military advisor. But you also have to have a director that's committed to listening to them. Yes. I, I didn't want to. I was going to bring it up earlier when we were talking about another movie. I won't miss what it is, Hurt Locker. But I <laughs> is so important for you because, listen, on that one, the, the guy, the EOD dude had to come out and explain that, well, we had to give up some of the, the you know, the real stuff or, or accuracy for the story. Well, then it's not, you don't have a, well, you know, I'm not going to get into it. But, well, I mean, look, look we, we did do some things in the film that, were necessary yeah. to filmmaking. For example, um, everything that happens in the movie happened. Right. It didn't happen to that unit necessarily. Correct. Yeah. And and we we had this unit, we had them go through several commanders, which is not what happened in real life. But I I couldn't do you're doing a miniseries, maybe, but not in a film where you would have a unit and then they go and then you bring in another unit and yeah. so it means four different sets of 60 man actors. You just can't do it. It's not yeah. possible. So, you know, we, and in fact, um, when we began the process, the families of the deceased, of the elite eight, um, 
many of them were not on board with the film at all. They thought we were going to Hollywoodize it, A, and B, that we were all going to profit off the deaths of their loved ones. And, and in fact, I should just say that almost everybody involved in the film received scale, which is the uh, movie making equivalent of, um, of um, a minimum wage. Right. So it, 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 nobody got rich, uh, least of all myself, but the, uh, they were really, really against it. And, and then when we started saying how we're going to have to conflate the stories and yeah. so on, it got really bad. But, um, I, I I, I will tell you guys, and, and we've talked about that. We must have talked about this before because it's oh. the turning point of the movie. Um, um, was that when I was in prep, um, on my, my, my son Hunter died. Yeah. Yeah. He was 27 years old. You know, you know, um, you guys have kids. You have kids, Jerry? Uh, of course, I have yeah. three. Don lost his son too, and I thought you two could commiserate on that. I'm sorry, Don. That's terrible. And how old was your son when you lost him? Nine. He was nine. Wow. Very sorry, man. That's so rough. And my my son was an adult. He was 27. And um, I, I went to the hospital. I was in prep, prepping the film, and um, so I get to the hospital, and he's on life support. He'd had a blood clot. And um, I had to make the decision to remove him from uh, his life support. Sound familiar? It's rough, right? And yes. My my wife, my then wife and I uh, had to make that decision. He. Uh, it's it's a, been it's interesting. Feeling. It's it's at the same time, Don. I think maybe you'll agree, the most difficult and the easiest decision to make. And um, but as he was dying, um, we're told, okay, remove it, and now he's got 20 minutes. And so we had 20 minutes of watching him breathe. And then um, I realized he was the same age as the guys who had died in the Battle of Kandesh. And I made the decision with my daughters urging to go back and um, make the film dedicated to him. But I also came to realize how I would have to depict the deaths of these guys. And that is with unrelenting honesty. Yeah. And I will tell you that once Hunter passed away, all the families got behind me and they got behind the film. They became lovely human beings. I'm very, I became quite close to some of them and, and, and for, and forever will be, you know, and it's like, you know, my son died suddenly, their sons died suddenly. Um, and it, it, was, it, was, it was really, really something and, and just increased my appetite for authenticity. So although there are elements missing also from the battle, for example, there was, there was a, a unit called Fritchie and they were up in the mountains and mm -hmm. they were overlooked unit and we took that out of the movie entirely just for the sake of clarity, not confusing too many things. Principally, the, the deaths of these uh, of these heroes uh, was depicted with as much accuracy as we probably as we found. We looked at the records, we looked at the eyewitnesses, we spoke to people. Rodriguez, re, you know, re, re simulated the simulated the death of, um, of Thompson for us. You know. Everything was really accurate from the point of view of those soldiers. There's Did you find some catharsis in it? Um, no, no. It's this. It, this was done like a couple of months after Hunter died. I mean, no, it was right after he died. And, and no, man. I mean, like it was. It was so raw, but it helped me get through that time. I had purpose. Yeah. You know, I had purpose, and, I, and I'll tell you this much: I put his photo up on my monitor. And when these actors, as they always do, come around to complain about this or that, they take a look, one look at that photo, and then they look at Ty Carter over there and this soldier, this former soldier over there, and they just said, fuck it, no, no worries, let's go on and make the film. And this, I will never go through anything like that ever again. This sort of love, a war movie that was made with more love than I've ever experienced in my life. And everybody humped their fucking ass, man. And we were all just so committed to it. 
and nothing was going to get in our way. And this company that made the film, they don't make movies like this. They make The Expendables. They make Rambo. They don't make movies where you have wonders. They don't do that. Yeah. <laughs> right. right. But they did this time. And the end result was a very successful film for them, the most critically successful film, according to Rotten Tomatoes. And should have, and I'm going to tell you this right now, it should have at least been nominated. Well, you know, it, it got released. And it wasn't by, pissed a lot of released, us off. Thank you. It got released by a very small company. And, uh, and I will tell you that I'm in the Academy. I vote. I've been an expert in the Academy Awards for since I was a little boy. And I will tell you that you need, you know, money and you need support to campaign and you know yeah. you need to be with it. Just wasn't there. I I I this so I, I rewatched it, you know, come leading up to this. I've seen it four or five times. But this was the first time I, I knew that you had a five million dollar you did that with only five million dollars? Right. Um, I, I I don't want to discuss the actual oh, budget okay. with well, you and, and there and you can but but hold on, I'll get to a little bit. Um but there is a separation, right, between what you call above the line and below the line. Right. Um, below the line is everything you see on screen, right? Above the line are things like paying the actors, paying the director, paying the writers, paying for the right to the book, stuff like that. I will tell you that what you saw on screen, the production budget of the film, is less than half of what you just said. What's Disney's problem? Why is their CGI so bad? They have endless money. We had, we had, you know, you know, what our CGI was. We had a little bit of CGI. The mountains were CGI. The tracers. Yeah, yeah. that's but, you know. And yeah. They were really well done, by the way. Oh, uh, the yes, but no, we, we actually some of the tracers were real. Go. Oh, really? What? Yeah, some of them. Yeah. Holy shit! Yeah, because my girlfriend is from Vienna. She was. She watches these movies with me, and she says, "This is a very good film. I really like this film." <laughs> she asked me, "What does that mean? What is this? <laughs> what is QRF?" That she asked that one night. <laughs> I, I have to. That's part of my job. Pause the movie and explain. And uh, but she really loved your film, and she says, "Those that look so real." You know. You know something, guys. What was interesting is that um, we when we tested the film, the studio was sure there was going to be a disastrous screening. That it would appeal to nobody, and uh, then they would have to take over the film. And and but um, the the research screening was a spectacular success, and the women liked it almost ten percentage points higher than the men did. Really, Scott Eastwood, <laughs> Scott Eastwood, Orlando. Well, it's, it's not that you know we like or Orlando. Orlando has got a massive female base, but um, the, what it is 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 that women do gravitate to characters. Yeah. They gravitate to people with, re and and we were careful to uh, humanize everybody there, and to you know not not make them cardboard cutouts, and you know you got to learn about everybody, you got to learn about ambitions and ambitions lost, and women gravitate to tragedy sometimes, and you know there was one part of that film that bothered me greatly, and that's when the black commander shot that dog. dog. My Ooh. wife. My wife and I are like animal. You well, I my my favorite other than my wife, my favorite person here at the hacienda is my beagle. Okay, Good for you, man. <laughs> His dog's name is Beagle Bailey. Well, what's it? What, what's your dog's name? Be beagle ba Bailey. Bailey. Beagle Bailey. Bailey. She's right there. That's Beagle Bailey. Okay. Good. Hi, Beagle Bailey. I was good. <laughs> I was good friends with a uh, very good friends. My dad was best friends with. Uh, the guy who created Beetle Bailey, more Walker. Oh, Beetle Bailey, yeah. Oh, Mort, really? Mort Drucker, right? No, 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 not Drucker. Walker. Walker, that was it. Mort Drucker was the guy. Who Mad Magazine. Mad Magazine. Yeah. yeah, yeah. Yeah, I keep forgetting Roger Nerd. Nerd. Matt can tell you and Jerry. Jerry, Jerry, you were not in Afghanistan or Iraq, right? No, no, no. I I'm not a combat vet, but yeah. you brought up ER. That was my trigger. See, I worked as a paramedic. Okay, and that's where it. some of my PTSD came from was oh, being yes. a paramedic. Yeah, and, well, Matt, Matt, I think that Matt can tell you that dogs were not very well respected. The, I was actually going to bring that up that I it didn't bother me, and I actually understand why he would make that, why he would do it, because dogs aren't looked at the same way in 
you know, in that culture. And also, I mean, met the guy, you know, <laughs> and, and it's, a, it's a, it's a true story. Again, yeah. it, was not, it was not that commander. Yeah. Right. The dog, but an, another commander shot the dog and, you know, it, it's controversial, right? And because we Americans, we love dogs. I love my dog. I got a great dog. I love her. <laughs> Anybody wants to take a shot at yeah. my dog is not going to survive the experience. You Amen. Know? I, I I have to one of my favorite moments with is uh, Orlando Bloom when he does the joke about is is this on with his rank? Yeah. Mm -hmm. I it, it, I laugh <laughs> because I I shit you not my sergeant made the same because we had the ACUs but the it was the mm -hmm. Velcro on front I shit you not one time he took it off went check check is this working yeah. and I, when I saw it I'm like oh my god yeah. they get no, it they, yeah, that they was get it. That was true to, to Lieutenant Keating. He, yeah. he did that. His father, uh, Keating's father, told us that story about how he did that. I, I thought it was it was just terrific. By the way, you talk about that black officer uh, played by Kwame Patterson. Rod, uh, we got to go to our commercial break, uh, top of the hour. Please, I want to hear the rest of this story right after the commercial break. He doesn't. He yeah. wouldn't go to commercial break if you wanted to hear it. I, I have to. <laughs> Commercial it's break. KGRA. Chanel, please take us away to Calgon. Hi, guys. This is Gary from Pop Culture Minefield here on KGRA, and we're Hello. leaving for our first break. I hope we survive. Hey, members. The new KGRA DB app is now available on iOS and Android devices. Gain on-demand access to any KGRA DB programming. Download any show directly to your mobile device to listen or watch on the go. Go to the App Store and search KGRA DB. Behind every folded flag is a family. When American lives are lost in defense of our freedom, TAPS is there to help the friends and families of those who have served and died. TAPS, the Tragedy Assistance Program for Survivors. We provide help, hope, and healing every day. Visit us online at TAPS.org or call 1-800-959-TAPS. Are you looking to go on a faraway journey that is magical and mysterious, reaping on mystical legends? If so, then Mysterious Adventure Tours is perfect for you. Imagine a voyage to explore ancient mysteries of Ireland, haunted majesties of Scotland, or their chilling birth of the vampires in Romania. These small esoteric getaways are limited and do fill up fast. So, go to MysteriousAdventureTours.com and book your trip soon. You're listening to the KGRA Digital Broadcasting Network. We provide unparalleled coverage of trending news in the world of ufology, cryptozoology, and paranormal phenomenon. Whether you're watching our video live stream or listening to one of our audio programs, you are getting the best from world-renowned researchers and hosts guiding you through topics the mainstream won't touch. Miss one of your favorite programs? No problem. Head over to the members area at kgradb.com for access to our massive library of award-winning content. Make contact, stay connected, only at kgradb.com. Oh, wow, we survived. Welcome back from the commercial break. Now for some more pop culture minefield on KGRA. I hate my voice and it's so funny. <laughs> Welcome back from the commercial break. Um, and before we continue, I want to mention that Christian Dorm sent three more super chats. Uh, one saying the military are the ultimate civil servants. Thank you for, for your Canadian $2. And let's see, third or second one is don't fret. Truckers are a holes too, Rod. That's from a Canadian trucker. We're back. So, and uh, and then of course, uh, many friends lost being myself. I'm not sure I get that one, Christian, but uh, God bless you for um, 
supporting this channel and our show. And uh, uh, and thank you for your $2 uh, super chat. So you were about to tell us a story about uh, Captain Broward? Broward. Broward. Yeah. Broward, yeah. Broward. Well, that is based obviously on a real guy. I mean, it's the, um, it's, I think the only time that I changed a name in the movie because the real guy um, did get fired for incompetence, was not there when the battle began as a, uh, as a result. And he went through a real humiliation in the military ranks. His name is, is in uh, Jake Tapper's book, The Outpost. One of the best, by the way, um, military books I've ever read. Maybe the certainly the best about the Afghanistan war. And um, but I, I just felt like I didn't want to humiliate this dude anymore, and so I changed his name. I, I yeah, that's I, I think that is yep. very missing in bottles and all that stuff, man. Wow. Because I um, well, I'll say this uh, similar. Our platoon sergeant, platoon sergeant was out with us when we got hit. And this dude, I remember I had just put myself out of fire. I was on fire, put myself out. And I went to his Humvee, grabbed the shotgun because we're being shot at. And this this dude pulled down his window and went, everybody, we got to go. They're shooting at us. And then put it right back up. And <laughs> never got out the vehicle. Now, they, they relieved him of uh, <laughs> his duty after that as well. But I remember just seeing him like, wow. It's, it's part of the whole... No one ever knows whether how they're going to react because he just came off the trail. He was a drill sergeant, and this was his first deployment as well. Mm -hmm. And you never know how you're going to react. The old uh, saying that I think it gets attributed to Mike Tyson, but you know everybody got a plan until they get hit in the face. That's right. Um, it, I heard it uh, in the Ghost in the Darkness, great movie, Michael Douglas, great movie. Anyway, but uh, yeah, I, I saw so many guys that were considered oh they're high speed you know they're the best and when we're in garrison but then they just completely melt down or freeze yeah you and i it. talked about that the other day yeah yeah and well, so you know uh, mike tyson is credited with that mm -hmm. um however uh the real person who began that was napoleon bonaparte who said that no battle plan survives first contact with the enemy i like my tyson's version tyson's, tyson's <laughs> version sounds cooler <laughs> Um, I got a question for you for myself. Um, what's next, man? You, you, you know, uh, it's like you sort of took a break. And uh, well, uh, I'm, I, I've, you know, movies, you know, movies take a long time to mm -hmm. make. Um, I just uh, finished a movie. It's called The Senior. Excited and, for it. Right. It's a, it's a, it's, a, it's a true story about a 59 year old man. True story who went back and played uh, middle linebacker for his college and played his, his senior year. And Michael Triklis uh, plays uh, Mike Flint. And oh, I like Triklis. Good actor. So he's a great, and a great guy. He's a great guy. He's just a lovely guy. And we've become really good friends. Mary Sue Masterson is, is in the movie as well. And, um, you know, I, I presume it'll come out later this year. We're um, going to spend the next two months sort of finishing it up. And then I've got like a you know a bunch of things on the um, on the horizon, including um, a World War II film, oh. um, which is something that I there's, 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 two, there, I, I have two dream projects. One is a very specific World War II film, which I could talk to you about, and the other is to make a movie at, at West Point. And uh, last year I was going to make uh, it's going to spend the summer making a, a boxing epic at West Point, and Lionsgate um, was going to do it. They commissioned and approved the screenplay. We got a budget together, budget issues. There are always budget issues. They usually get resolved. The difficult part is getting West Point to approve shooting there. They've been very selective. In fact, I don't think any full feature film has been shot there in uh, 70 years. 7-0, seven not 7-7. Seven, seven. And um, we got this one approved. And we were raring to go. KJ Appa, who's the lead of Riverdale, the TV series, mm -hmm. and uh, and then um, very sadly, my dad got really um, sick, and he needed help, and I just couldn't make the movie. I had to go deal with my with my father, who then died in June. So uh, it's like 
if I would have known you're going to die, you know, I would have. He was 90 years old, um, a truly great man. He's a fucking warrior, war hero, Israeli army, unfucking believable stud, and uh, was the um, most successful political cartoonist in history, according to the um, Guinness Book of Records. And I've and actually he, read about your dad. Yeah, yeah, uh, he was. He had quite an old bit in the New York Times. Anyway. Uh, so I could have made the West Point film, and I still hope to do that. And the World War II film that I want to make, let me see what Don thinks about that. He's our historian. I will connect you with Dale if you say I, yes. I, I'm, 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 I'm cool with Dale. I mean, we're <laughs> no, but let me see. Because, I'd like to see the two of you work together. We did. He, uh, we worked on um, on resurrecting the camp. And, well, uh, I'd like to see it again with a military in a war, in a war scenario. Yeah, it was in uh, in nineteen, um, as you can imagine, in what was what is now Israel was then Palestine during the Second World War. Those Jews uh -huh. in Palestine wanted to go fucking kill Nazis. Yeah, yeah. and Churchill wasn't letting them. And then in nineteen forty five, he let them. And they were allowed to form a brigade. It was called the Jewish Brigade. And this Jewish Brigade went to Italy and, you know, shivved these fucking Nazis. <laughs> they kicked their fucking ass. Nice. And it's just, and they're wearing the Star of David. Can you imagine you're a Nazi? And you, <laughs> you see that? Yeah. <laughs> this is not going to be good, you know. And um, it's an incredible story. It's based on a book by Howard Blum. I've been trying to make it now for um, 20 years, True. and um, we're 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 close to we're close now. And uh, you need some my father, you know the my guy. My father I'll help was you. one of the uh, GIs liberated Dachau. Yeah. Okay, and uh, yeah. I'll never forget. He was uh, kind of a uh, a dog robber. You know what a dog robber is? No. Okay, well, they go out. He he could scrounge around, find shit, mm. you know, liberate shit that they needed, etc. Mm. And uh, he had uh, come up somewhere. I'll never forget this story. He came up with uh, a bag of coal. Okay, uh, literally a bag of coal. Now this mm. was when you know Germany had been overrun, and. Uh, you know, the Nazis were all taken off. Uh, and he had gone down to the docks. This was in Bremerhaven. Had gone down to the docks. He knew a guy that was on this ship. It was a Liberty ship. Mm -hmm. that, And he, he wanted to trade for uh, some food stuffs. I, I think some eggs and some other things, if I remember correctly. But at any rate. Okay, it's late, late afternoon. It's getting dark. He knew the guy. He went up the gangplank. The guy was a guard. He was standing there with an M2 carbine <clears throat> to make sure nobody could get on the ship that wasn't uh, belonging. Mm -hmm. Suddenly, <clears throat> this poor son of a bitch comes streaking down the street, being chased by a bunch of Germans. Mm -hmm. And they were screaming, Joden, Joden, Joden. This guy apparently was a Jew. Mm -hmm. And these bastards still wanted to kill the Jews. Yeah, well, that's not this go guy, away. this guy yeah, with the carbine stood up there. He took a look at that. My old man is just watching. He didn't have a weapon. And this guy put it on, well, M2's fully automatic carbine put it on fully automatic and just opened up on that gang of crowds that was that were streaking down the street yeah yeah i said uh, oh that that had to be crazy he said you would not believe what you could do with a couple of packs of lucky strikes and a hershey bar <laughs> so <laughs> nice hey hey rod you mentioned that you wanted to do a movie at um west point have you ever heard of the eggnog riot in the 1826? It happened on West Point. Yes, I, I have, but that's not the kind of movie I'm talking. I know. About. I didn't think that was really in your wheelhouse. <laughs> My movie is written. It's very, it's very specific, but uh, that's a good. That's that's a good. That's a good tale. I want to tell a modern West Point story. Is what I want to do. 
Um, well, Rod, uh, so you do have things working right now, then. Yeah, sure. So when you start moving towards stuff, uh, I'd like to have you back in and talk about them. Sure, of uh, course. You guys, you guys, you guys are, are great guys. You know that I've been better through through I, time. I, uh, you got to pay me. What, Rod? What? <laughs> I, I'm excited to see the senior. I was reading about it and read about the story because um, as a kid, every Saturday night, my dad and I would watch The Commiss, which was a great, great show. Yeah. I, I I loved the whole Nicholas opening bit. He's a good actor, period. With, with he's a, he's a great, he was great in The Commission. He was great in The Shield. He was great in yep. Vegas. And he's great in The Senior. And it's a, it's a very different version of, uh, of uh, Michael Chiklis. Look. I, oh, behind the shield! That oh, oh God. the shield! Yeah. Oh, he he, that that guy. And I was a cop. Okay, I was a cop, and uh, my wife and I used to watch that. And she would look at me, and she she'd answer, "Can they really do that?" And I said, "No, not legally, sweetheart." He beat a confession out of a guy with a phone book. Okay, now you the phone book doesn't leave any marks. And he just, they were looking for a child rape. We're, learning, or something. we're learning the secrets right now. From <laughs> I, I was a conversation. You, you, you don't want to say anything that uh, you're going to have to take your fifth on later. Uh, in, in Iraq one night, we, we, we grabbed these guys. They, they ended up being this kill squad that was going after politics, whatever. Anyway, so we were swiping their hands to see because we had all these wires and stuff in the trunk and was seeing if they've been messing with explosives or whatever whatever and the test came back uh negative and uh the sergeant and i we were talking about he's like man okay like, he don't know what that means vic Mackey, the motherfucker he'll tell you what is what's up <laughs> <laughs> that's the character from the shield just so exactly you know. yeah yeah well look it's been it's been wonderful being with you guys you guys are all awesome and um you know, yeah. Thing. You know, next time we I have one people. last question before you go, man. I'm sorry. Go ahead. I, I apologize. I meant to ask you earlier. It's uh, I wanted to go back over it because you seem to have had a good experience working with Milo. Milo Gibson, yeah, sure. Yeah. Um, even though um, it was a short okay. role. I'm sorry. It was a short role for him because he, you know, he gets killed. Mm -hmm. But you know, uh, what do you see? Do you see that kid having a future? Yeah, of course. Are you fucking kidding me? No, I, I'm know, not. I I, I really I like him, him. I saw him in um, it's a movie in, in in a comedy film that was directed by Peter Facinelli, and I just thought he was marvelous in it. And uh, Breaking and Exiting was it that one? That's right. That's right. Good, Good film. film. Yeah. Wow. That's I mean, fucking impressive, Jerry. Oh, it's. You, 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 you don't remember the the conversation we had the first time? It was just like you and I were like just nerding out talking about films. Wow. Well, it, it's it's a really good film and he's really good in it. And yes, I I do think that he's got a very big career ahead of him. And he's got this wonderful sort of naturalistic style. One of the trivia questions about the outpost is name all the children and grandchildren of uh, of Hollywood royalty. And there's a lot because you got Milo Gibson, son of Mel Gibson. Right. You got of course Scott Eastwood. Then you have got. Um, uh, Will Attenborough, who is the grandson of Richard Attenborough. The Get the hell out of here, really? Yeah. Yeah. He plays Faulkner. And then you've got, um, and then uh, the kid playing, um, the kid playing Scusa is, his name is Scott Alda Coffey. He's the grandson of the great Alan Alda, one of my best friends. And, and then in a very small role, You've got Jack Jagger, who is Mick Jagger. So. Mick Jagger. Yeah, I knew that one too. Wow, that is really good. A lot of uh, legacies. <laughs> yeah, I mean, it, it's 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 definitely a coincidence. But uh, and I've got to watch the Outpost again this week. I'm gonna. <laughs> well, I just found really? out thanks to this guy uh, down there in the corner uh, or in the middle there, Mad Chismo. He, uh, I didn't know you had a director's cut. Yeah, I, I just found that out on Monday. You talking to me? Yeah, the outpost. I had no idea you had a director's cut. I only know oh, the version. Oh, oh, yes, yes, yes. I'm sorry. I, I, yeah, there is a director's cut. It's like 15 I mean, minutes longer, I think, or something like that. Yeah, a little less than that. There, there is a there is a scene in there that I really loved that uh, somebody at the studio decided to take out, which is a big gripe that I have. But it's a it's a it's a really good scene about the discovery of a 
of a baby in the mouth. Yeah, that was one that Mad was telling me about. Now, now I've got to see it. Um, yeah, it's, good. it's good stuff. Well, um, your movie is going to be a subject of discussion on this channel and, and some of my other channels yeah. until I'm dead. Uh, mm -hmm. Because I do consider it the best war film of the last decade and one of the top three best war films of the last 40 years. Thank you very much. Thank you. And, and I ain't shitting. It's that good. I, and it, I'm glad that you guys got handled correctly, even though I wish they had put you out there for a nomination because that film would have won. If it, I, I wish it would have been released to the theaters because I really do think it, it has that thing that American Sniper had when it came out. I think it would have blown the doors off of the, the theaters. Yeah, it's COVID, COVID killed us all. You know, we were gonna we we're gonna premiere it at South by Southwest, and then uh, a premiere at West Point was being talked about, and uh, you know, it's the way it goes. But uh, well, I know you got to go, Rod. I want to thank you for coming to the show again. I know absolutely, been, Rod. Thank he's you, been very quiet, much. but he loves you, man. He really does. Thank you, thank you guys. Thanks, thank Rod. You. And you are absolutely a friend of this yeah, channel. Thank you. And uh, all I can say, one last, two last words. Beat Navy. Beat Navy. Airborne. Nice you, sir. Airborne. Cheers, guys. <laughs> yeah, Thank you, Rod. Rod won't do it. That's gay. For, for me. No, no, I'm not going <laughs> to scream airborne. Pathfinder. Air assault. Are we just yelling things? <laughs> <laughs> I remember the funniest thing I ever heard was uh, uh, in boot, we were like uh, in the chow hall, and you just heard like, heard, like the sound of 100 trays hitting the ground. And you hear one motherfucker in the back yell, "Airboard!" <laughs> oh, damn it. I forgot to bring up uh, one of the, my favorite moments in the outpost is when the guy comes into the into the bunk and he's like, huh? And the dude mocks him like, oh, yeah, huh? like nobody at because I oh, yeah. hate, hate that. We had our we were very over it, I guess, as a as a platoon. We. Just we were more of just tell us we don't need your motivation, your speeches, or oh, this is scout weather. We don't need that shit. Just tell us what we need to do. We'll go get it done. You know, don't try to tickle the asshole kind of a thing. You know what I mean? And Ooh. whenever we had to do, they would be like, oh, we were like, oh, oh. Be, is, well, look, listen. once you hit permanent party and you've been there for a bit, all that that stuff is just silly. Oh, apparently not for the officers. Listen, we're we're coming out oh, yeah. of the field. Second Last story, I'll let you that fucking salute. <laughs> Last story, and I'll let you you get back to hosting the show, Gary. Last, listen, we just got back from the field. We're at uh, Fort Hood, and I have the water cannon. We're washing this Bradley, and it is pouring down rain. And I'm shooting water at this Bradley, and just a downpour. And some major, whatever he was, came up. He's like, I know this seems ridiculous, but, you know, and I'm just like, oh, sir, uh, scout weather. What the fuck? <laughs> he, he looked so disappointed that I didn't buy into his, you know, this is what makes us, you know, blah, blah, blah. We go, we do things when others don't. And he, he looked so sad that I didn't buy into it. That I'm just like, just let me shoot my water cannon at the thing and the water in the rain. It's fine. Sorry, it still bothers me to this day. No, there's lots of funny little things. Like uh, my problem was uh, the new, you know, the new lieutenants that come in, and you can always spot a reservist. Oh, that, you know, are the worst. Their lapels are all fucked up, and their hats aren't clean with a crisp turn, and not wearing it down. And over they're their nose lusting for that salute. But they went that they're salute. And I was out on the tarmac because uh, my unit was three um, oh med ambulance. And we're P PMCSing our uh, Humvees out on the tarmac, Air Force tarmac there at McClellan Air Force Base. And um, this second lieutenant comes walking by and I'm sitting there and it's hot as fuck. So we get to, you, know, you, you do you remember wet bub count? Did they have that when you're in? It's, it's it, it Don or me? Humidity, heat to humidity factor. That once it hits a certain temperature with a certain amount of humidity, you get to take your top off. Uh, and and get, what, don't like, like to wear your if, cap. All sorts if, of shit. If, 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 uh, if you take off your top, do they throw beads at you too? What are you talking about? <laughs> I, I, I was a scout. I was, I was talking about arms. Old days. We didn't um, have any humidity. Like, ooh, the humidity is bad today, guys. You don't have to wear your tops. What are you talking about? They hated us. No. <laughs> they all hated us too, but... Uh, anyway, so 
we were out there at what would be called uh, wet bub level three, which is uh, tennis shoes, uh, unbloused. We wore BDUs, not ACUs. And uh, I wore BDUs. your T-shirt and with no BDO top, but you were wearing your cap. Why? And who? Who? For what? What were you doing? P- PMCSing a vehicle out on the tarmac. You got to wear tennis shoes. Yeah, when it got to that level, yeah. What base it, was this? I told you, it was the 308th Med Ambulance, which was on McClellan Air Force Base. I, where's McClellan a, Air Force Base? That's Sacramento. Cal, Sa- I was at Fort Hood. I don't know if you you're familiar with the well, weather here in Fort Texas. Hood. I know Fort okay. Hood. I was there was no Fort point. <laughs> August, July, there was no point. They're like, "Hey guys, throw on your tennis shoes. We're going to the motor pool." That never happened. And you're in there in California, in Sacramento, like, "Woo!" The Air Force didn't even look like military. Ball. They don't even look like military. They just walk around with like hair over their ears and mustaches. Oh out yeah, of their ears. yeah. Um, you know they get paid more if they have to live on a on an army base. Yeah, it's ridiculous. It's like uh, those guys get, they've got the life. But anyway, so the second lieutenant comes walking by and I turned and looked at him from under the hood and I said, morning, lieutenant. And he about faced and came back at me. And uh, he says, you got a problem private? And I stood up and I realized I have no rank on me. He has no idea what my fucking rank is. And all my guys are standing next to me watching like, what's going to happen here? And I start wiping my hands off. And I said, no, I don't have a problem, uh, second lieutenant. Do you have a problem? Okay, so you made a, a very smart decision in this moment. Mm-hmm. And he just stood there for a second. And he's reservist. He's a reservist. So these guys are fucked up to begin with. And he just goes, I'm sorry, sir. And he salutes me. I said, as you were lieutenant. <laughs> he walked away. And my guys were like, how do you get away with this shit? And I said, I'm assertive. I'm not afraid. Yeah. Oh, I mean, listen, I think one of the greatest lessons we can take from uh, Big Trouble in Little China is if you walk into a place yes. with a phone and yes. a ladder, you can get away with anything. Yes. <laughs> anything. You know what I'm talking about. Yeah. <laughs> and a lot of it also will depend on how you can look at somebody. Yep. And my nickname was Captain America because I was 6'3", lean, and... All American looking is ridiculous. Stare them in the eyes and just grin. I did not look like a combat oh. soldier. I look oh. like a leader. <laughs> That's right. This was before uh, Chris Evans played Captain America. That's right. So it makes more sense now that because anyway. <laughs> <laughs> hey, you don't get to laugh at that, Keith. <laughs> You're my friend. <laughs> <laughs> Done. Uh, when I when I was a cop. And whenever we'd get a new guy, and you know, if I'm left seat, right seat, or whatever, uh, my the only advice I'd really ever give them is the only person that that should know you don't know what you're doing is you. Just fake it. Yes. Whatever happens, fake it until you can get back to your car and Google what you're supposed to be doing right now. That's it. <laughs> Amen. Uh, one of my things, and I'm sure you probably, I bet you did the same thing. You get some dipshit. In senior NCO or officer thinks they know how to do your job better than you do, tells you how they want it done, and you absolutely tell them, yes, sergeant, or yes, sir, and then they walk away, and what do you do? Exactly, exactly what you were planning to do it the first way. Of course. And if it falls apart, you better own it. Yeah, listen, <laughs> hey, that's just mil- not military, co- uh, being a cop, too. We had this new uh, supervisor come in, and he would, you know, before you put in the report, they got they're going to go over it. And then the desk sergeant will go over, blah, 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 right? So this dude made all these corrections. I gave it to the desk sergeant who knew I was good at what I did. And he changed everything that that dude changed right back to what the hell I had it as to begin with. Yeah. Right. No, I don't trust leaders. I don't trust management. They're dumb. I don't know what happens when you read. I guess something about E7 and above, you lose common sense. Or you lose the ability to think about things in a critical way. Does that make sense? Because they, no, yeah. they want us to do dumb things. No, absolutely. Um, and they, I, they, they give you some of the worst fucking suggestions of how to do something. Listen, RCO came out with this one night and he loved Bradley's. So he made us take our Bradley out and I'm driving this thing. And then he's like, okay, we're going we're gonna to go blackout. I, I, I don't, I don't, I, the NVGs I can't have on inside of here, and you have a fistbowl that you have to take out the the little eye thing. NVGs are night vision, guys. For those of you yeah. who don't know, 
so what would normally happen is we would stop if we're going to do this and I would take out one of the um, uh, uh, periscope looking things and put on a fishbowl, which is a, like a giant thing like this to see in in, uh, uh, in night vision so I could drive. But no, no, no. We're just going to keep driving. Don't worry. Your BC will tell you a little bit left, a little bit right, a little bit left. <laughs> and that's how we – so, you know, we knocked out the power to uh, to an entire Mahala, a, a neighborhood. <laughs> Because I, yeah. all I heard was left, not left, right. It just took it all down. And uh, our, uh, our sex and started came over the radio. It was like, yeah, we should go somewhere else. <laughs> we should <laughs> not be here. <laughs> right, I can see it. Oh, my God. Um, so yeah, that buddy was not got the killed. land of the 24-hour generator. Is that what you're telling me? <laughs> what? It, it, this Mahal, I don't oh. Man, that wasn't – I was gunning in a Humvee, and we had this dumb, dumb mortar. I don't know. Mortar oh, – anyway, he's dry. – we left the vehicle behind us, called it, hey, your vehicle's smoking a lot. And I looked down. I went, hey, did you put – did you take the emergency brake off? He's like, no, it's oh up. Oh, my God, no. <laughs> no, it's up. I'm like, I called about yeah, yeah, we figured it out. Anyway, we're going through this mahal, and there's all these uh, cable wires hanging from the generator, and it gets – uh, it's going underneath the turret and uh, my god i'm like stop 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 he says go 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 and takes off almost ripping me out of the turret before he stopped we ripped down everything oh um, mortar mortar guys are idiots <laughs> i'm sorry <laughs> i get it good job somebody tells you numbers you 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 match it with what you're looking at it and you drop it cool it's needed <laughs> but my god Oh man. So, um, I, I keep forgetting, but I did know that you're a cop. Are you still yeah. active or what's going oh, on? Hell no. Are you kidding me? Not in this climate. <laughs> He's trying to make me wear body cameras and stuff. I don't want people to see what I'm doing. Oh, fuck. <laughs> Not in an illegal way. You misunderstand me because yes did good. i really misunderstand yeah you? <laughs> yes it's good to have accountability and stuff but it limits officer discretion right because if, if i get a guy he has a a dime bag it i i no longer really have that option of just stomping it out and you know let's go on away i'm not gonna do my paperwork for a dime bag you know what i mean right because they're well, not that's supposed what's to great about california you can have a dime bag you can have a 50 dollar yeah. bag it doesn't matter <laughs> Okay, I, I was they using made that grass yeah. legal out here. Yeah, well, because um, and, and I'm I'm fine with that, but uh, because you're only supposed to be using the footage from the car and the body camera for you know investigations or blah blah blah, uh, not disciplinary uh, disciplinary action. I don't trust management because they're dumb. They're bureaucrats most of the time, anyway. So yeah, never yeah, trust the, the bureaucrat. Oh, man, a lot of them. And they got up there because they're ass kissing. Mm -hmm. They kiss now, a lot of ass. For and you they'll guys, hang you out to dry. Or a Mason. I when I was a, a detective, I found that out. Oh yeah, I almost became a Freemason. Uh, big in the military and, and police. Yeah, but they started talking about doing all this volunteer work. I'm like, that is. I'm joining to have the advantage of being a fellow Mason, not to actually do volunteer work. So I didn't yeah. join. I want the advantage, not the work. Yeah. Um, for your guys' amusement, uh, here we go. We got some uh, military memes. Uh, two of them, which I made myself based off of actual stuff. Wait. <laughs> <laughs> Look, that's what. That's, it's, it's really hard to pull off when you have green paint on your nose and your you nose. Gotta call someone else You're really going to call some. Yeah, I mean. Here you go. This one is a, a nod because my son served in the Air Force and. Uh, I make fun of the Air Force a lot. And this is actually true. It's it's actually based in, in fact. Because, um, yeah, I'll just show it to you. There you go. Have an enjoyment of that one. <laughs> oh, jeez. Eight-digit grid? What? Eight-digit grid coordinate. You gotta, why, it, why not a nine? Well, eight, you have to have at least an eight-digit to call in a fire mission is what we were taught. And um, so, but they never learned that. Not until they started being put on the ground in um, Afghanistan. And finally, they started. This is in 09, uh, around 10. They started um, training Air Force 
to call in fire missions and air support. So they finally learned. But this one's one of my favorites because I said this to my first sergeant. There you go, man. What's your brain? <laughs> these i i've never i've never seen dad jokes in meme form i'm gonna say i'll, I'll remind me i'm gonna send you some oh, good bullshit. military you, you've memes. seen a meme you've seen a dad joke fuck you <laughs> and here's what i was talking about i was a giant there i am that was in basic yeah you i still look don't like see you're Chris having Evans. way too much fun sweetheart I did. Uh, sadly, I, I really enjoyed these guys. I like serving with these guys. I had a blast. And when they found out I was an artist, I did the mural in our barracks. I, I got, I had to do KP, KP the last week of basic training. And my sergeant liked me so much, he put me on the milk machine. And all I had to do was make sure that the, the, the milk was taken care of. And I had this sergeant walk up and try to tell me to go somewhere else. And I'm standing there in the at ease position. I said, I'm sorry, Sergeant, I can't leave my puzzle. That's not properly relieved. <laughs> you said so many things there that are uh, no one under 50 is going to know. What is a milk machine? Well, in the chow hall. That doesn't help. It, a the, milk machine anywhere wouldn't help. When you go through the chow line, you, you can pick your drinks and you can get milk. And it come, you have that big knob. You pull push down on it in a bag, dumps milk into your cup. Oh, like if, if you're getting a Slurpee at a 7-Eleven? Yeah. But it's not made specifically for milk. No, this is. <laughs> I got to tell you, some conversation you with you it? make what? me wonder what the fuck we're going on about. <laughs> what the fuck, man? The, the details that you focus on sometimes well, blow me away. I, I've never heard of a milk machine outside of one that's milking a cow. So you're telling me no, you're on have, KP. They the, they're, they're machines that they put the big dairy bag into. And it's just like McDonald's where you get uh, milkshakes. But instead of being slurry... It's just straight. Okay. Milk. So what, what did you do with this? You're on KP duty. What I had you... to make sure the bags were in there. That's all I had to do. But I acted like it was my guard duty and I wasn't allowed to leave my boat. And the sergeant was like, just kept looking at me. He didn't know how to respond to me. And he Sometimes just. Sometimes I feel like we we're in different militaries. Well, we were <laughs> by about 20 years. <laughs> that's I mean... like, that's like uh, Don talking to me about shit that he probably went through in the army. I'm just like, Really? <laughs> really? I mean, they still laid hands on people because I heard a guy get his ass beaten basic. I yeah, heard, well, we we, we had jungle boots and they still wanted them shined. Okay, you'd come in with red mud all over them, clean this shit the shit up. The ones with cans. My boots look like shit, troop. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. I uh, I, leather and canvas. They tried to really. I was at the end of the BDU phase into the ACU. Yeah. So I I mean I know. Shining boots and stuff like that, yeah. Trying to get that that uh, uh what's it called? Get an iron. I be able to see my face. Oh no, I'm not giving you that. Come on now. Listen, I I was a horrible garrison soldier. Great in the field, great deployed, but oh boy, did I make some bad decisions. I got caught one time. I didn't. I didn't get caught. What happened? So we were having uh, first arm was doing an inspection, all the new you know uniform shit or whatever. Got to get it ready. And the, after so close the business, you know, in the day, they saw me leaving with these two chicks or went drinking. I may have had a little bit too much and didn't get everything done. I uh, got in a little trouble for that. And uh, yeah. Not trouble, huh? The point is, I lost it. <laughs> it doesn't matter. I don't know what I was talking about. <laughs> Oh, hey, let's talk about the uh, interview today. How, what did you, you guys have a good time? With, I did uh, excellent. Don was iffy at times. <laughs> you know, I was you... just going to tell you I was getting used to you, asshole. <laughs> but uh, now I'm you not made so me watch fucking Alien sure. Outpost. <laughs> Alien Outpost. <laughs> did you Don, see it? Did you I've watch never, it? I have never seen something so aggressively mediocre. It... <laughs> It contradicted itself in the opening text, <laughs> and it only got worse from there. It, oh my god! Ten minutes, Don, and that is gone. Uh, well, I want to say again. Warning: The following program involves discussions. I'm just not going to get through it. Oh, <laughs> so uh, Fumula. <laughs> so I take it you didn't like Alien Outpost, huh? 
He liked I, I didn't movies finish it. And he did not like it. <laughs> no, man. I listen. I enjoyed She Hulk ten times more than the five minutes of Alien Outpost. Now, Gary, you watched Alien Outpost. You, you know I didn't you like it. Liked it. The good, the actors were not that bad. A shit, Gary. Like <laughs> Don't say like no. The actors weren't. Oh, yeah. There was a couple of actors in it. Did their really good job. They must have came in in the second act because I, <laughs> I, like I did the not dude see that ended people. up getting killed. Also, uh, that was that was either Turp or whatever he was. He gets Who? taken by the alien. I think he's good. Gary, I made it less than ten minutes into that movie before I was done. Oh, I, so I cannot give you far. plot okay. points. No. Okay. <laughs> well, then you can't fucking talk about it, I, but yeah, yeah. Don. <laughs> You die. You, anything you say from here no. on out is horseshit. Don, <laughs> listen. I, I, all I can picture is the meme I, of the I dude. I don't want to fucking hear it, man. No, all I can picture is the meme of the dude hovering over the plate, about to take a shit, and the das, guy's like, "I don't want a shit sandwich." Well, you don't know that's what it's gonna be. I I don't need to see it come out. I know it's shit. I don't need to see it happen. Five minutes. I got it. I, I was good. Hey, oh my god, this right is good. Over my head. Right over my head. John Ostains, you know what I'm talking about, the, the milk me. <laughs> As a cook at school. <laughs> uh, let's see. Famula, uh, first of all, welcome to the show. I don't think I know your name. Um, Mad, tell them the story about the thing that happened when you stole the sergeant's okay. armor for the car. Well, all right. it, one, it wasn't a sergeant. It was a uh, general. Uh, two, so remember when I said I was great deployed, I was a horrible guy. There was moments in deployed as well. <clears throat> on the Bradley, you have reactive armors, these blocks filled with explosives. So when you get hit by an RPG, absolutely not. I would just yell the whole time there, Dr. Anonymous. Anyway, the, the, to, to have the explosion go out rather than in. I hadn't driven the Bradley since uh, I was at Knox. Uh, sh shit happened. People got moved around. Now I have to drive it every once in a while. When you turn a track vehicle, you have to accelerate through the turn. Right. Or it's just going to just do this is gonna uh, skip and people are gonna be mad they're bouncing over the place so all i knew was the power slide every turn in doing so shit would fly off the bradley sometimes you know cones sea wire whatever and we'd have to stop and people would have to pick it up one time brandon and i uh we get back we're working on the vehicle and i'm looking at it i'm like brandon come here man something looks weird he's like yeah we're missing two blocks of the uh reactive armor I'm like how the hell did that happen well, he's like oh, i don't know maybe they're in the turn so but nobody knows we went to our xo and we're like hey you know we're missing a couple how do we get he's like shut the fuck up he has the list shut the fuck up and get in here i don't care how you do it but you're gonna find it and you're gonna find it quick before anybody notices Apparently, it's a big deal if you lose C4 and explosives out in Iraq and Baghdad. No, <laughs> no, whatever. So we're Bigger like, okay. the odds. So we're driving around and we saw this pow of reactive armor in the middle of nothing. You know, uh, all the vehicles are around, but it's just nothing. So we drove up, we grabbed a couple. Uh, Brandon's like, hey, maybe we should grab some extra ones because you, <laughs> you can't drive for shit. I'm like, agreed. So we grabbed a couple more. And then these Dodge pickup trucks came out of nowhere. And this guy comes out, he's a sergeant major, and he just starts yelling, hey, put that shit down. Who do you – just yelling. I was like, Brandon, you got more time in grade than me. Maybe you should handle this one. So uh, Brandon goes, hey, uh, what's going on, sergeant major? And sergeant major goes, do you know whose reactive armor that is? And Brandon goes, oh, we thought it was community reactive ar armor, sergeant major. like, you know, hey, if you're missing a couple, come by, grab it. He's like, that is for general – I'm not going to say his name – of 4th Infantry Division at that time. For his personal Bradley. So we put it back. Um, now, we had already had a run-in with this general uh, kind of – there was a picture taken of us with our sunglasses on top of our heads. That was his pet peeve. Our XO was in a meeting with this general. They are doing their little meeting. And the sergeant major comes in, and he whispers to the general. And then the general goes, who the fuck are they? What were their names? Why do these guys keep fucking with me? Who do they belong to? And our XO was like – those are our guys they're they're idiots i i don't know how how they're they're dumb we'll, we'll take care of it so uh yeah um i ended up running into him at fort sam he was giving out his coin you know like they do and i because you know so the fourth id guys there and i'm i'm there and i see him looking at me every once in a while 
and he's looking back and he gets to me he looks at my name plate and he looks at me he's like you you healing up, up okay i'm like yes sir doing good all right he went to the next person i went that son of a bit vindictive mother he didn't give me a coin wow i didn't know he you was don't understand guys armor. those coins are important oh yeah challenge coins what a, I'm not even going to say his name, but if I ever write a book, I'm putting his name on it. Hell yeah. <laughs> anyway. But yeah, I got in trouble sometimes. Do you got yours with you? <laughs> my, he kind of was, man. What, my, my no, coin from him? you got no. yours with you. Your coin. Yeah. Don, you did not listen to my story. He didn't yeah. get the coin. Well, didn't you get one anywhere else? But, yeah. Well, oh, do you have husband? it with you? No. Uh-oh. It's oh, your yeah, fuck I up, I guess, because Don has his. <laughs> That's right. <laughs> guess who's buying tonight? <laughs> I guess oh. it's you, man. Yeah, yeah. Well, no, that doesn't count if we're... First of all, we're from two entirely generations. Well, there are generations between our generations. Mean shit, motherfucker. No, no, because we can't have the same coins here. You know, it's supposed to... No, no. <laughs> You could just have some random coin, but like, hey, you got your coin? No, I didn't serve in Korea. Oh, or no, I just no, use it. As an no, you didn't. Use it as an example. Yeah, okay, it's like any conflict. Let's see what it is. Oh, Purple Heart. Yep. Uh, I never got oh, a coin for that. Wait, you didn't get a Purple Heart for your injury? No, I got a Purple Heart. They didn't give me a coin with it. Oh, there's supposed to have a coin. Wow. Wow. <clears throat> Call up the VA. Where's my fucking <laughs> coin? <laughs> Dude, they, they took my driver badge. I found out I had a driver badge when they told me that I, I lost it because our vehicle was a total loss. Wow. They, got, <laughs> they gave it back. Apparently, somebody was like, hey, this may not be a good idea to take awards from guys that are blown up. But yeah, <laughs> because by, by reg, if it's a total loss, you lose your driver badge. I didn't even know I had one. You got and, your uh, coin, yeah. Gary? Um, no, nothing left from my experience. <laughs> I've been through three divorces, and it, somewhere between the second and the third, just things disappeared, <laughs> including a, almost all my photos. They're gone. I only have a handful of photos that survive. Oh, yeah, I've been I, divorced, too. I, I have so many things that are not with me anymore. It sucks, dude. I miss because there are so many guys that if I had the photos... Because on the backs of the photos, I wrote their personal information. Yeah. Oh, they're gone. I can't find uh, these guys. Photos, all all of ours. You know, we we would well, we would load them up to MySpace at the time. But our camera that had Brandon and I, all of our photos, uh, we lost in the vehicle. But yeah, um, that th there's this pillow that I I got when I was in Germany from the nurse. This whole thing, and uh, it was with me the whole time through the hospitals. My ex wife threw that shit away. <laughs> uh. Man, the well, Bradley. Um, now that that has piece of shit. What, it's a piece of shit. I knew that. <laughs> yeah, twenty-five Mike Mike. Yeah, you should watch uh, Pentagon Wars. I've actually got that queued up. I'm going to watch that this week. I'm watching. It's because it. you. Yeah, it made me angry, but you'll laugh at my pain. Is that aluminum armor? <laughs> yeah. Hey, Don. Fun fact. You know what happens when aluminum <laughs> burns? <It melts. laughs> you know what happens when it burns, though. And you inhale the smoke? Yeah. Ooh, shit. RPG-7 will take that out, right? Well, that's why you got the reactive armor. Yeah. If it doesn't fall yeah. off your vehicle. Uh-huh. Okay. Just checking. Just checking. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I, I wasn't sure. Oh, it. Listen, I. when I was driving, the engine is right next to me. And the panel between me and that engine, I wouldn't say... I wonder if I, if I'm going to have problems from all the, the, the fumes coming off of that, you know, don't, I mean, let's not even Long bring up depleted issues. uranium. Have you had any breathing had. issues from it? Hmm? Have you had breathing issues from it? Uh, no, but I'm going to definitely going to blame that if I do get them, you know what yeah. I mean? Yeah. Well, I'll tell you what, man, and a look for whatever it's worth to you. I was uh, a service officer for uh, MOPH, for the Military Order of the Purple Heart, our chapter. And uh, all of that shit, keep your freaking dates and names of anybody around you in a list somewhere. 
<laughs> store it, guard it with your ass. And uh, if something comes up, because I still have shrapnel in my back and my ass. And every once in a while, that'll kick up. And, uh, you know, I I'll tell you, you know, because the VA is notorious for losing shit. Okay. I, I have had problems with, and all my stuff is documented, but, uh, boy, I'll tell you, don't give those motherfuckers a break. Do not ever give those guys a break Well, because look, they won't give you one. Yeah. Um, so I'm at 90%. Um, and that's not even including the traumatic brain injury that they did not identify until after all of that shit was done. Uh, because so I saw I, I, the first time I saw uh, somebody asked me about the, the whole traumatic brain injury. I was in the hospital. I remember being in a uh, wheelchair and the guy goes, all right, tell me about the explosion. I said, I don't know if there was an explosion. I didn't hear anything. Well, no TBI here. Now, the reason why I didn't know there was an explosion was because it knocked me out and I came to on fire. That's why oh. no secondary questions from him. So clear TBI. But so I'm familiar with them uh, missing things here. PT, I I didn't even get um, rating for for PTSD. And I, I want to hear that. you want to hear an ass kicker. And this this is God's truth. <clears throat> After I got hit, they flew me down from Kwong Tree. They flew me down to Fubai. I was in the 85th Evac Field Hospital there, long enough for them not to administer any morphine. I was begging for a hit of morphine. Then I, they yeah. flew me down to the 95th. They took me right into surgery. I'm in surgery. They administered the anesthetic. I fucking die. Literally, I'm dead on the operating table. Oh. Was dead for Good Lord. close to two minutes. And uh, obviously, they brought me back. So I wake up. My wife's laughing over <laughs> in the corner. <laughs> oh. <laughs> yeah. I, I mean, I was about to ask, are we in your Jacob Ladder situation? Like, <laughs> yeah, it's <laughs> Jacob Ladder. <laughs> I wake up in ICU. Me? And this nurse. Huh? <laughs> no, I wasn't there. No, this nurse <laughs> walks up to me. Hey, Matt, fuck you. This <laughs> nurse walks up me. to me, and she said, you know, Don, I've been waiting to see you for a long time. And I look up at this girl. I have no idea who it is, none. And she said, by the way, you're from my hometown, or I'm from your hometown. This chick was from my fucking city out to a PA and wow. I couldn't believe it. She wrote her parents who got in touch with my parents. They were both still living then. A lot of red they flags. became card playing buddies. So my my mother, when I get back, she says, Are you going to see Mary? Because the girl's name was Mary. And uh and she had been pretty damn cute. Unfortunately, she got knocked up by one of the doctors. Oh. <laughs> in the hospital and she was six months pregnant when I ran into her again so I said now nah, that romance is out the window dude Don, <laughs> you, you lucked out there was a lot of red flags with her that I was picking yeah. up on <laughs> yeah by the way uh, if you can blow me up real quick I changed my uh, that's the pillow that I was talking about if you see my avatar that's the actual pillow that was with me but yeah your wife threw it out uh, ex-wife yeah yeah i had a girlfriend that got rid of all my damn photos from okinawa wow boy i had some good shit in there too but uh, <laughs> well, well. yeah you say things like that and i begin to wonder what does he mean by that <laughs> <laughs> but uh oh goodness man that was a good show um hey Matt, I hope you had a good time, man. I did. I I, I like Rod Lurie a lot. A little, a little. It hurt a little bit that he's like, "Don't remember you." I'm like, "Well, I don't remember you then." Um, <laughs> I felt like he warmed up to me by the end. Yeah, yeah he's he's a really good guest. He, I, I I like talking to him. 
Rod's cool. But I did the same thing. I did the thing I always do. My girlfriend always tells me, like, maybe you shouldn't when you meet people. But the first thing, Don, you weren't there. The first thing I said to him, he had this NFL hat on that just said NFL. I was like, <laughs> oh, yeah. That's when we went uh, live. Uh, I like the hat. You know, you're uh, the non committal hat you're wearing. You're like, oh, I'm not, I don't want to commit to a one team in the NFL. I just like it in general. <laughs> NFL. <laughs> if it's your shit, that hat did not make it to stream. <laughs> wow. <laughs> And he said, if if, if he were to, it was the Eagles and no, no. He said he didn't have an Eagles or uh, Chiefs hat to wear because the Super Bowl is coming up. He never, he never gave us. A, uh, uh, you can't to, say that, so Matt. You here. can't say Super what, Bowl. Eagle, the big game. It's the big game. Oh, sorry. Those motherfuckers. Can you? <laughs> <that? laughs> this world, we can't say SB, but we can say motherfucker. What, why started. why can't we say Super Bowl? Just stop saying it, Gary. Roger Goodell's going to be knocking on your door. They'll sue your ass. Really? Yeah. Yes. That's why it's always called the that? big game. You know, you'll uh, see the lawyers come on the commercial. This is the craziest shit I've ever oh. heard. Yeah. Can like, you elaborate, hey, please? Fans? I've not heard anything about this. Yeah, this go is- ahead, Martin. You know, if any of you want to elaborate about this, because <laughs> this yeah. is all. Oh, over. you don't know. No, I'm yeah. Um, Mex- I'm in Mexico. We don't know anything about this big it, game. Oh, <laughs> no, the, this, no, no, no. The, the, here, people is obsessed with that. And the American football and everything. Well, so people, uh, companies and stuff, they'll do like, oh, win a new, you know, 70 inch <laughs> TV for the big game because they can't, they can't use oh, the it's hype. an ad. Got yeah. You. you can't use it because, do they have a trademark on it? Yeah. Yes. yes. Yeah. Yes, Gary. They've trademarked the name Uber Boo. Uber Boo. I, I didn't want to say it. Yeah. <laughs> Colon Blow. Yeah. That is Gary, it. That is what Gary. we call it from this day forward, Matt. Uber Boo. <laughs> I, I could see the look in Gary's eye. He was like, I'm about to, man, I'm about, I'm about to get the rights to SuperBowl.com. I can't believe they didn't do this yet. <laughs> <laughs> Got him. <laughs> Oh, there is the episode of the league. One of the uh, one of my favorite shows love of all show. improv. Yeah, I love that where show. Taco got the rights to DallasCowboys.com or maybe Cowboys.com because it lapsed, and so he got the rights to it. And Jerry Jones had to negotiate to get it back from him. It's a great episode, but uh, uh it, it kind of reminds me of the South Park episode where the kids got the Redskins. <laughs> they got the oh, name you mean the Redskins. Now. Washington Commanders. Washington Commanders. Now, yeah. um, that was fucking funny. The South Park <laughs> episode. Because they're just yeah, going after the whole cancel culture thing. Um, it was hilarious. You know, they were, the, the original name that they went with was um, The Sentinels. Until somebody was like, hey, uh, Mr. Snyder, uh, I don't know if you've seen this movie, The Replacements, but that name's already been used. Because in The Replacement of Counter Reeves, there's Washington Sentinels. Oh, yeah, that's right. <laughs> Whatever. That's a good movie, by the way. I yeah. do like that film a lot. Oh, absolutely. Good yeah. Um, I... I, I yeah, I think um, – wow, what's his name? Falco, right? Yeah, Shane Falco is top five fictional quarterback. I think he's better than Johnny Utah. Well, yeah. <laughs> what, um, what is your – you know, that, I mean, I'm curious. What is your Willie favorite – Beeman. Don, Keith, Martin, and Mad, favorite sports movie? Comedy. We'll go with comedy. Oh, comedy? Oh. Jeez, slap shot. Fuck yeah, slap shot. Great fucking movie. Oh, that's good. Hudson Brothers. Uh, the replacements is up there. Oh, uh, major major League. I... Major League's great. Damn it, you took oh. that one. Ah, <laughs> some bitch. I like the movie Necessary Roughness. You would. Right. Fuck you, man. <laughs> <laughs> Keith, what was yours? Oh jeez, um, Kathy Ireland's in that fucking movie. That's all I got to say. Yeah, Kat- was, oh jeez, mm. Kathy Ireland was great in that. As my dad would say, he says, "I'd eat a mile of her shit just to see where it came from." And I'm like, but- is that music? Is that a hint? It's a hint. We got to go, and I'm I'm yep. Keith to tell the, me the, nigga the no, no, the longest yard. Oh, great film. Bro, oh, Adam Sandler. Good, or the good Adam picture. Sandler remake. Oh, ha, ha. <laughs> ah, ha, ha. Yeah, of course, the original. Martin, do you have a favorite sports film? Yeah. 
And I concur with Jeebus. It's Caddyshack. Oh, great film. But Happy golf comedy. is not a sport. It's a game. So, so and with then that we can... said, oh, no, no, no. Sorry, you're, you're done. Um... <laughs> <laughs> That's the end of the show, guys. I want to thank everybody for being here today. <laughs> Martin quit. <laughs> uh, do I have enough time to um, say everybody's name? I want to thank everybody in the chat. Do, do I? No, you do not. I... Joss nope, Wolf and Penny, nope. Anima Confusa, Andy Morrow. No, nope, we have no. BRB. Is that it? Hey, buckled up, kittens. Take us out, Chanel. My kids. Right down.